We're in Ecclesiastes. Uh, we're going to look at uh, verse number one there in just a moment. But uh, before we do that, we're going to have just a brief bit of review. We're under the concept of time. This is the third part in the doctrine of time. And uh, we noted this morning that there are five categories. There is a historical category, and we learned that this is the overall concept that Jesus Christ literally carved out of eternity 7,000 years of human history. He himself designated the beginning. Paul designates the ending. And uh, you live during this time of history. God himself lives in eternity, and his infinity tells us that he transcends the boundaries of time. But the very fact that uh, we have it is his invention, and it's something that actually is very good and can be used for his glory. Secondly, we have the idea of dispensational truth or a category of time. We learned from this that God has actually carved out of the 7,000 years seven periods of 1,000 years by which we can relate to the beginning and the end. You can know precisely where you are. 6,000 years is about up. But underneath the concept of a cardinal dispensation, you live in grace. That means that the other six you're not a part of. Now they're connected, it's all one savior, it's all one overall plan, but it's distinctive as well. So we live in grace and that's the concept of a cardinal dispensation. We learn too that there are various epics and even epics within epics. We saw the times of the Gentiles, the uh, time of Jacob's trouble, the 70 years of Daniel, and then the time where the fullness of the Gentiles will be accomplished. All of these various things are epics and uh, distinctive in and of themselves, but part of an overall program known as the times of the Gentiles. Now, the last two we're going to deal with uh, this evening. One is the typical, and the other is the personal. And we saw that the typical actually had to do with the regular or normal ongoing process of life for each and every one of us. God started a process whereby there would be a summer, fall, winter, uh, and springtime, and a harvest season, a planting season, and so forth. Now that's actually where we come in here in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3. We could read uh, various portions, but for the sake of time, we won't. But simply to point out that to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Now, why does the Lord Jesus Christ give typical time? He does so to prove a point. And we again are going to put the 7,000 years of human history before you. Here is eternity past. Here is eternity future. And the Lord Jesus Christ set in motion some normal processes. A time to be born, verse 2. A time to die. A beginning and an ending. A time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill, a time to heal. A time to break down, a time to build. A time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away. A time to rend, a time to sow, a time to keep silent, a time to speak. A time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, and time of peace. Now, he is saying all of this because the Lord Jesus Christ has given time to prove a purpose, and we'll show that in a minute. This is called typical time. This is something that you and I go through each and every day of our lives. And uh, there is a reason that we have this. What is the reason? Chapter 1, verse 2. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all of life is vanity. 
even though we have typical time, the Lord Jesus Christ set this in motion to prove a point that life without God is basically humdrum, boring, dull, and of no profit. Actually, the word for vanity is the word bubble. Uh, you can see a bubble or many bubbles floating around, and they're beautiful to look at. They gleam and glisten in the, the light, but they're empty and they don't last very long. Bubbles are extremely fragile and transitory, and so is life without God. So he set typical life in motion to prove a point that life without God is uh, worthless. Therefore, verse number 17 of chapter 2, I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous, its vanity and vexation of spirit. I hated all my labors which I had taken under the sun because I should leave it to a man that shall be after me. And who knows whether he'll be wise or a fool. You see, it's vanity. You worked so hard and built the empire and now you die. Uh, you have worked your fingers to the bone and would you have bony fingers and you leave it to another fella and he wastes it all. It's vanity, it's empty, it's worthless. The so-called dignity of man. Uh, and life without God is worthless. So Jesus Christ set in motion typical life uh, to prove, or typical time to prove a point. Now here is the point. Verse 1 again of chapter 3. Every purpose, the word every is the Hebrew word kol. Now the interesting thing about this particular word is that it means each and every part of the, and it's in the singular, or designates a singular. Each and every part of the singular. In other words, the time to be born, the time to die, is one of the each and every parts of some singular purpose that God has in mind. What is that purpose? It is this word, kafetz. And it means a matter or an issue at hand. Each and every part of the singular matter or issue at hand. Now actually this particular word uh, could be used in a variety of meanings. But basically, it means to alter, to bend, to incline to, to shape, to form uh, in a certain way so as to fit a specific purpose. See, eternity past and eternity future are different than time. But Jesus Christ customized this little blip in eternity. 7,000 years is a drop in the bucket when you think of how long eternity is. He customized this particular blip and made it for a purpose. What is that purpose? To give us typical life. But to show us that typical life, as good as it might be, a time to, uh, to uh, plant, a time to harvest and so forth, is still vanity without having the Lord Jesus Christ as number one in your life. If you do not have that which can translate into eternal blessings from time, you literally have nothing. You've literally wasted your life. And that's why throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, all is vanity. Chapter 1, verse 4. Why? One generation passes away. The other generation comes. The earth abides, but the generation doesn't. The sun arises, the sun goes down, it hastes to its place. The wind turns south, turns back north again, and so forth. Uh, verse number 8, all things are full of labor, man cannot utter it. And you go on and on. And this is, this is life looked at from the carnal or natural point of view. It's all vanity. And so he says in verse 11, 
There is therefore no remembrance of former things, neither shall be, there be any remembrance of things that are to come or those that shall come after. Everybody eventually forgets. Uh, the people will remember you, put up a, a plaque or, a, or a, uh, a monument to you, but eventually even uh, those people forget as generations die. All right, now let's come to Psalms 90. So the important thing uh, about typical life is to exploit it. Use it for eternal spiritual profit. Psalms 90. And now we're going to come to the fifth usage of time, our fifth category. And that is the personal category. So teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts unto wisdom. Now, uh, often we talk about practical truth. You see, I for one believe that the doctrinal and practical are not two separate uh, categories. Sometimes for um, uh, uh, technicalities you can divide them, but they're all one. Uh, it was never meant to be different. If you're filled with the Spirit and you learn something, you automatically, if you're filled, are living it at that very moment that you learn it. And uh, people have made a division concerning the doctrinal and practical, but they're, they're not two separate things. They're one and the same. You have to be filled with the Spirit to learn. You have to be filled with the Spirit to live. So therefore, as you're learning, you're living at the one of the same time. As you're filling full, we learned this about Lucifer, you're fulfilling at one of the same time. So it actually is a false separation or division. Though again, as I said, to accommodate um, our, our, our minds, we um, often do that. But we're, we're getting into something that is um, extremely practical, personal, a category of time. You're alive. What are you going to do with your time? Well, so teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts to wisdom. Now notice this was a Psalm of Moses. And so he gives us the word so. It is the Hebrew ken. And it means literally to establish, to set straight, or the most basic literal uh, translation would be to organize Accordingly, we might say it's to be set just so. And that's what the word is. Help us, teach us to organize accordingly. Lord, here we have these days and we understand that uh, our days are limited and, and few. And uh, so we look back to verse number uh, nine where it says, For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. You see, we're still under the curse. This is one of the reasons that the Holy Spirit groans. He must neutralize the old sin nature, but allow the curse to run its course in our bodies at one at the same time. Now, he's not wanting for strength, but uh, uh, that uh, certainly must be a pain uh, in the neck to him. He's groaning. Why? Because he's got to allow our bodies to be cursed and get old and die and be subject to suffering. But at the same time that's happening to neutralize the old sin nature. Uh, so we're, we're in trouble, but we're glad for his help, his, his enablement. For all thy days are passed away, all our days rather are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. So teach us then to number our days that we might apply our hearts to wisdom. So teach us. In other words, organize it accordingly or just so. Now, the words teach us is this one Hebrew word, yada. Now, the first thing we want to note about this word is that, is that it's in the hifil stem. And hifil is causative active, so it's a request. He is asking God to do something. It's a prayer request. 
How many times have we prayed, and rightly so, for those that are in physical peril? But here's a guy who says, Lord, I've got stem, a request for you, causative active. Take an active role in my life. Cause it to happen. Don't not to heal me, but to organize my life. <laughs> Almost sounds like a personal confession here. <laughs> Lord, please have mercy. Organize my life. He'll feel stem. Causative, active voice. Yada. Now, it's also in the imperfect, which means it's an incompleted action. Always cause me to have an organized life, to number my days. What does yada mean? Well, it means literally to cause to know by personal comprehension or experience. You're sitting here, you're in full fellowship with the Holy Spirit, and the light bulb is turned on and you see it personally. You understand it. Hey, that, that's right. That's good. I see it in front of my eyes. It is inside of my soul. It will never leave. I can always recall it when I need it. Cause me, always cause me to do this. So it means to cause to constantly realize, constantly realize the effectiveness of this organization. Constantly realize the effectiveness. Again, he feel imperfect. Organize my life just so. And now, Lord, cause me to see its effectiveness, the efficiency of organization spiritually in my life. I've got a purpose and a point in my life. Do this for me, will you please? Help me to see what you want me by way of organizing something. What is that? My days. How am I going to organize them? I'm going to organize them by numbering them. Mana. Now, Mana means to officially a lot. So you're looking at your life and you're going to a lot your time. But the Christian way of life is lived one day at a time, just as God says a thousand years is one day and one day is a thousand years. The Christian is one day at a time and then basically one week at a time. That one week is actually the framework in which we all should organize our lives. It's one day at a time we live, but one week at a time we organize, okay? Now, I'll show you that in just a little bit. That's what, that's what Moses is talking about. Now, how do I know that? Because Moses gave the Ten Commandments regarding the Sabbath, <clears throat> Sabbath day, where it says, Six days shall you work, but the seventh is holy to the Lord. So you organize your life to do what? To apply your heart to wisdom to get Bible doctrine, you see. So he is actually talking about organizing your life around a one week frame of reference. Now, in this particular case, we've got something pretty unique here. It's in the cow, which means the regular understanding of the word, but it's in the infinite, infinitive rather construct. Now, why bring this up? Because the infinitive construct means to express purpose, obligation, or direction of an action. Teach me to number the week directly before me. Help me, Father, to organize my life. I've got, I've got seven days, seven 24-hour periods. Help me to live in the light of the fact that I've got to be ready for the time when I can apply my heart to wisdom. This is, this is extremely important to understand. If you're going to do anything for the Lord, you must organize your life around this seven day frame of reference, just like Moses. Now, let's uh, go back then to the week and go to the book of Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 and verse number Eight. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
Now the word holy there simply means uncommon, distinct, sacred, sanctified, set apart, different, uh, like the cookies that the Keebler elves make. They are uncommonly good. It's uncommon. It's not profane or common. It's an uncommon day. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. See, Moses, who wrote Psalms 90, verse number 12, is saying, Lord, teach me to organize my days. So teach me uh, to, to organize them that I see the efficiency of living this way. And do this because it's my purpose in life, the infinitive construct. And it, 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 it expresses direction. Here's the direction I'm going, Lord. To do what? To reach that seventh day for the purpose of applying my heart to wisdom, getting Bible doctrine. You live the other six days in light of what you've learned that's the seventh day. Now, that's what he's talking about. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. Don't do any work, neither your son, daughter, manservant, maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Therefore he blessed it and hallowed it. Now, the difference with us is simply this. We do not worship on the seventh day, but on the first day. But the principle of organizing your life around a seven day frame of reference is the same. Now, what do we usually do? And this is going to represent Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday for some of us. Most folks simply waste their Sundays. As far as applying their hearts to wisdom, they either don't come to church or they come to one service. And then when they do come, they simply get entertained in most churches. Uh, as, um, uh, as I mentioned this morning, the one person said, the rah-rah group. And then they go home and uh, they just slough off, either watch TV or go for a Sunday uh, ride. This is all these Sunday drivers that you beep at. Um, then they go to bed and start their work day, okay? So they get up then. They spend much of the time sleeping. All of us usually have to have six hours rest a night, some more, some a little less, but that's an average. So much of this time is spent sleeping. Now, of course, if you work Monday through Friday from eight to four each day, that's just an average. You spend two hours getting ready and getting to work. So you get up at six o'clock and you're there by eight. You're off by four, two hours getting back home. So you've got the 12 hours basically of that time that is spent in work. And then usually you have something to occupy uh, that night. Now, what should you do? Well, you should have taken your notes in Sunday. And on Monday, when you have your personal devotions and your Bible reading, you should also take time during Monday, Tuesday, and so forth to learn what was taught on Sunday. But most folks do not. They spend their time getting involved in so many other things that their time is wasted and dissipated. So that by the time they get to Friday, they say TGIF, thank God it's Friday. And they're looking forward to the weekend to do what? Just to sit back and they don't prepare. They don't organize their lives. They, they do their personal things on Saturday and on Sunday, or they stay up late Saturday night as, so as to have an excuse not to get up for church on Sunday. Now, this is a seven day period. Teach us to number our days so that we might apply our hearts to wisdom. You go over what was taught you so that you're ready for the next study the next time you come to church. You take notes and then you, you have to work, you have to eat, you have to get cleaned up, you have to travel, you have to spend time with family, you have to spend time with friends, but you should put in the time somewhere there to spend time with God. If you don't, that's why you don't learn and you don't know how to live your life as unto the Lord, where you work and, uh, and at home. All right, now, if you will, please um, turn with me to the book of Numbers, chapter 15. Nope. 
Please note that I, I have had um, this study prepared for a while, and uh, I want to show by this what most folks do and why Christianity is failing, and we are failing. We're getting smaller and smaller. We are reduced to drama. Um, we're reduced to pageants and uh, uh, constant programs in order to draw people to the church, and they still don't come back. They'll come back for food and that sort of thing, or, and food and fellowship, but never for study. And yet the very thing that God gave you time for, as Moses said, is to have a seven-day frame of reference in which to organize your life to be ready for that one day when you apply to doctrine. Everything, every other day should be lived in the light of getting your job done for the one day. Six days you work, the seventh you don't work. It's set apart for one thing, and that's the study of the Word. Now, um, in Numbers chapter 15, we have a, an interesting thing here in verse number 32. It says... And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. And they put him in a ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. The ward is simply a prison, a, 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 a stockhold, that uh, sort of thing. The Lord said to Moses, the man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp, and they stoned him with stones, and he died as the Lord commanded. Now, why did God teach to put him to death? Turn to the book of Leviticus, chapter 23. The book of Leviticus, chapter 23. It says in verse number 3, Six days shall work be done, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, and holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is a Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Now, again, we saw that principle in Exodus as well. So, Let's just take a peek here concerning a law. Now, I'm, I'm addressing something, and I, again, as I said, this has been something that I've wanted to address for some time. Why? Because Christians do not understand regarding the, the rule and the exception to the rule regarding the Lord's day, quote. And I'm going to try to address this because it is important that we all understand it. And um, as I speak this, I speak it from a heart, a pastor's heart that loves his flock and congregation and wants them to benefit by way of an organized life for the one day to apply their hearts to wisdom. Now, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Now, let's read verse number 10. Just follow with me because uh, we're going to look at one of the reasons why, uh, I don't know why, I have, for the longest time, talked about or an organized life around one day. And it is so important. Uh, I wish, we, we have so many young folks that are associated with this church that, um, that really could, could care less about a so-called Sabbath principle or, or studying. I'm glad for one young person uh, who's, uh, whose parents care enough about her to make sure that she's here around that one day. While other kids, as I have seen, coming here to church, are out playing baseball, we've got just one who is here around the Sabbath principle. Now that's going to make an impact. 
I don't care if the people uh, that are out there, uh, boys and girls that are playing baseball, go to the professionals and make millions of dollars. Their life will never have the impact that one life that organizes his or her life around the Sabbath day principle, the seven day principle here. That person's going to make an impact amongst the angels and for history and the glory of Jesus Christ. That's why it's important to see this. But there are exceptions to the rule. But then again, there is the rule. What is the predominant factor? The rule. You organize your life by working six days and having one day set aside for just the Lord. Okay, verse 10. Now remember, this is the personal category of time. And what we have here is the most practical thing in all of the world. I've got a week ahead of me. I've learned some things about time. The pastor has taught me. And I'm going to have my personal devotions. I'm going to have my personal Bible reading. But I'm also going to learn these principles by taking and writing down his, his concepts, a verse of scripture and his concepts on a card. And I'm just going to move them up from my hand to my arm to my head. Uh, we'll look like Willie Nelson or the 60s hippies. We'll have our little phylacteries up there and we'll just take them around driving our car. No, I don't suggest you do that, but it's to be learned. All right. Now, verse 10. If you hearken to the voice of the Lord and keep his commandments. All right. So we have the word keep here, which is the law and which is the rule. Keep it. I, I don't have it in here to make a suggestion that you organize your life and meet with me one day a week. It's to be obeyed. Uh, that's what verse number 20 says, that you mayest love the Lord thy God and that thou mayest obey his voice. So we're back in verse 10. Keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in the book of the law. And if thou wilt turn unto the Lord with all thine heart. Okay, so here we have keep. And over here is heart. Now, now please, we'll, we're just about done. Just, just need a little more academic concentration to the, to the end here. And you'll, you'll see it brought together. Here are people here uh, that we have just read about who are law keepers but they keep it with their heart. All right. Now, on the other side of the fence is a person that we just read about, a law breaker. He was disobedient, uh, disobedient and it, he did not have heart, no heart. Obviously, if he was gathering wood on the Sabbath day and uh, it was a violation of the Lord said, stone him, no heart, that's the rule. You either keep it with all your heart or you don't keep it because you have no heart in the law. You don't like the Lord or his system. Now, verse 15. See, I have set before you this day life and good and death and evil. In that day I command thee to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, keep his commandments, that thou mayest live and multiply and the Lord will bless thee. But if your heart turn away so that thou wilt not hear and be drawn away, I denounce you this day. All right. Now, on the other side, we're, we're going to have people who are obedient externally, but no heart. Come with, with me to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew, chapter 15. All right. Here is a law breaker, but he is disobedient too. You see, God kept the law to be, God gave the law to be kept. These people were keeping the law, but they didn't have their heart in it. These two extremes are wrong. This is the rule here. Keep the law. Here is a person who didn't keep the law and was killed justly. 
Here was a person who kept the law, but he had no heart in it. He was just as wrong. If you come to church and uh, put in your time, punch your time card, well, I was there, yes, I, I was in church, but uh, what are you doing here? Are you actually learning something? Can you comprehend what's going on here? Does it apply to your life? Do you use six days to prepare for the seventh? And do you give the Lord the full benefit of that one day uh, and yourself the full benefit? Then came Jesus, verse one, to scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? They wash their hands when they, they wash not their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? You, uh, God commanded, saying, Honor your father and mother. He that curses father and mother, let him die the death. Whoso therefore shall say to his father or mother, Korban, or it is a gift. Uh, in other words, what they were doing was saying that mom and dad are getting a little older now, and um, uh, I've got a lot of money set away here as a Pharisee. He was taken out of the... Um, uh, the coffers. But if he would say to the other Pharisees publicly, Corban, everything that I have is a gift to God. He could take all of that money and not have to help his aging parents whenever they were in need. And that was a, that was a neat little religious trick. Uh, they sort of couched uh, this money so that their parents could get no help if they just said, it's a gift to God, it's dedicated to God, Corban, Corban, all of my money is dedicated to the Lord. And so his aging parents could not touch it. Uh, but Jesus said, wait one second, that's a tradition. The rule is honor your father and mother. Help them out if they're in a time of need, especially as they're aging. Now this is the principle that he's giving here. So therefore, he said, you have made, last part of verse number six, the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draws nigh unto me with their mouth, honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Yes, they keep the day, but there's no heart in it. So we've got uh, uh, two people here, three kinds of people here right at the moment, rather. The rule is, keep it with your heart. This is those that were spiritual and advanced spiritually under the dispensation of law. There were the law breakers who were disobedient with no heart. There were the law keepers who were obedient, but they had no heart. And God despised them and they, they were going to be punished too. Even though they were not capitally punished as this person was by stoning, uh, these people died and went to hell because there was no personal relationship with the Lord. While we're in Matthew, let's go to chapter number 12. Now, here are law breakers, but they they break, they're, they're obedient, but they have to break the law, and they have heart. Here's where there are exceptions to the seven-day period. Okay, let's, let's look at three exceptions as we read verse number 12, uh, read verse number one in chapter 12. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn and his disciples were unhungered. Now please remember that Jesus Christ was on a blitzkrieg mission from the Father. He had three years to go across all of Israel, to preach in all of his towns and cities, to confront people and with his Messiahship and the fact of the coming kingdom. So, he was on a, an appointed mission from God. He was commissioned for a different thing uh, as far as God was concerned. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Exception, have ye not read what David did when he was a hungered and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread which was not lawful for him to eat, 
neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Now this is 2 Samuel 21, 6. Eat the showbread, it's only for the priest. It's sanctified, no one else eats this. David comes up and he eats it. Why could he do that? Why was there an exception made? Because David had been anointed king, Saul hated him, and Saul was trying to kill him. That's an exception. <laughs> Under normal circumstances, what would David have done? Organized his life so that he could meet with the Lord in the seventh day. He's the one who wrote in the Psalms, I love to go to the house of the Lord. Uh, I, I'm looking forward. I, I pray toward the house of the Lord and so forth. I'm looking forward to that. But this was an abnormal situation where if you have personal disaster, I mean, if an earthquake hits your home, if a hurricane hits your home, naturally you're not expected to be there the seventh day. You got to, to clean up the, the mess. That's an exception. But the rule is keep the law. But if you're at war, or if there is a personal disaster, or if there is a tragedy in this sense, it's an exception to the rule. And in this particular case, the tragedy was the kingdom was coming. Jesus Christ had to get to everybody. He did not have time to, to prepare for the Sabbath day. So he and the disciples just simply went through a cornfield, picked up the wheat and ate it as they went. And Jesus said, that's an exception. All right, there's another exception. Verse number five. Have you not read in the law how that the, on the Sabbath day, the priest and the temple profane the Sabbath? That is, they make it common. <laughs> Preachers work on Sunday. Everybody else is supposed to rest. You see, that's the concept. Why? Because they have a special appointment of the Lord. They're in a different category. If, if they were uh, simply among the masses, they would keep the rule of the six days. But because they're not, their job is to be done on the seventh day. It is a legitimate exception. So that if you want to win a person to Christ on, on the Sabbath day, and you're talking to this person, and they're real close, and uh, the Sunday evening service is just about to, to come on, but if you had another 15 minutes, well, forget the service. You spend the time with that person witnessing. But that's an exception. The rule is... You, you be there, okay? If you're an ambassador for Christ, the exception is if you're talking with somebody about the Lord, you continue talking, all right? Now, verse number 10. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, it is, law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? Now remember, this is business. And in this case, it's legitimate. If it fall into the pit, also it's compassionate here. Will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? I mean, if you've got an accident, if something happens, you need to help out somebody. Uh, somebody's sick in your family, your kids are sick. It's lawful to do good on the Sabbath day. But that's the exception. How often does the, does the sheep end up in the ditch on the Sabbath day and where you have to go lift him out? And if he ends up there every Sabbath day, you better have, <laughs> you better have some barbecue the next, uh, the next week. Uh, just eat a little bit of that. Uh, mutton, uh, barbecued mutton. Uh, take care of that dude. Why? Because you need to organize your life to the rule. But if it so happens that the exception, it's good to do well on the Sabbath. Now here is the general rule regarding the, the organized life for, for six days working, a seventh day dedicated to the Lord. Verse number um, seven. If ye had known them, what this means, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You would not condemn, note the word, the guiltless. There are three exceptions to the rule. And Jesus calls them guiltless. There's no guilt there. They haven't, they haven't broken a law. They don't stone them for goodness sakes. They didn't do anything wrong. Now, but did they stone somebody for working when they should have been resting or listening on the Sabbath day? Yes. What is the rule then? Under controlled circumstances of an organized life, if you did not organize your life so that you have to work or do something different on the Sabbath. Now, I'm, I'm speaking generally here. The rule is integrity. 
cut off that man from his people to keep sin from Israel. Integrity. Keep the rule. And if it, if it means uh, stoning, that's fine. But under the uncontrolled circumstances of war, personal disaster, and that sort of thing, uh, sickness, uh, business, the, the kids got sick, and that sort of thing. Um, or if you're talking to somebody about the Lord, the idea is mercy is to be applied. It, mercy is more important at that point. They're not, they're not guilty. They're doing something uh, which is the Lord's bidding or a life has uh, turned them a bad twist. Have mercy and compassion. But the problem with most Christians is that rather than controlling their circumstances and living by the rule and maintaining integrity, everyone wants to live by the exception. And that's why Christianity is failing.